Um, we are thrilled to introduce Michelle Deck, President and CEO of Games, a company that provides seminars specializing in adult learning and interactive teaching methods. Michelle has won the prestigious Excellence in Nursing Award and has been selected as a Great 100 nurse in Louisiana and was elected to Sigma Theta Tau National Nursing Honor Society. Among other accomplishments, the National Nursing Staff Development Organization named her the recipient of the prestigious Belinda Putes Award in 2000, and she received the Margaret Massort Lectureship Award from the Magnolia Chapter of SUNA in 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Michelle Deck. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you on this beautiful day? The sun is coming out. Such a beautiful city to be in. We need to appreciate that. So let me just ask you this general question. How many of you have the joy and the challenge of teaching people? Raise a hand. And in that teaching, sometimes you and I find people who think all they have to do when we're teaching them is to take up space on the earth at that moment. That's all they have to do. And they think you and I can plug a cable into the back of our brain and the other half into theirs. And we could just download all of our years of knowledge and experience without them having to do anything. So just tell me if, if you have ever had that challenging learner who thought all they had to do was take up space, wave wildly at me, give me a sign, yes indeed. So we're all in this together. So what I'd like to share with you are a few important things to think about when communicating with and teaching those who think all they have to do is exist at that moment in time. So let's look at quickly at our objectives. We're going to discuss the four types of learner engagement and also the importance of each type relative to enhanced learning. So let's talk about this because, you know, you and I know all about Dr. Malcolm Knowles and the study of adult education. All the people that have followed Dr. Knowles since then boil it down to one thing. The critical difference between adults and children, of course, is life experience. We know that, duh, we've got that. What's important is getting the person you're teaching to see relevance and usability. We may know why it's relevant that we're getting this across to them. We might know how they'll use it, but the key is getting them to see relevance and usability. And if we can do that, then people are much more likely to incorporate the things we're trying to teach them into their everyday practice. So I want you to, to kind of take a minute and think about that. Relevance and usability, which means it's really all about engagement. And there are many definitions of engagement. I've just put two up here from some recent educational psychology research. Here's one. Behavioral intensity and emotional quality of an, a student's active involvement in a learning activity. Okay, that makes sense. Psychological connections within any environment in addition to active student behavior. So when you look at what engagement is, to me, there's two big headings. And here they are. Emotional connection and active behavior. Now, what does that mean? So now it's time for some truth in telling right here. I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 30 years. Don't ask me how many. It'll make me sound old. I love doing the job of nurse. One day, my manager came to me and said, you know what? You should teach new employees. We're going to make you a preceptor. And this is how she did it. Bang, you're it. Bing, you're it. Bing, that's you. So I want you to think about sometimes we find ourselves in roles that we were not trained to do. And of course, when I started teaching people, I made all kinds of mistakes. How many of you have ever learned the job you've done on the job itself? Anybody? Yes, okay, I don't feel so bad anymore. What I thought was there was so much knowledge to get across to people. And there were so many skills to teach that that's where I needed to focus my time. Knowledge and skills, boom, there it is. So little time to teach those things. So what I did was I eliminated everything that looked like what I'll call fluff. 
Anything that looked like fun, history, out of here. We don't have that. Anything that looked like any kind of personal involvement, out of here. I don't have time for that. Let's get right down to business. Blah, 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 do, 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 goodbye. Well, you know what happened. People went around that system. And even though I thought teaching them knowledge and skills in a straightforward way, blah, 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 do, 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 would work, sometimes they were whispering to each other when I was trying to teach them. How many of you have ever seen whispering going on? Yeah, a few of us. And you know what I found they weren't whispering? They weren't whispering this, I am so thrilled to be learning this. That's not what they were whispering. What they were sometimes whispering was a common complaint. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, why do they put us through this? I already know this stuff. Do we have to go over it again? Why is she doing this? So what would happen is people would make an emotional connection, but they would connect in the negative. They would find a complaining buddy. And you know what? Just two people who complain to each other and have that negative emotional connection, you know what they seek to do and can do successfully? They can recruit others to the dark side. And so instead of just one or two people being negative, you now have half the group or three quarters of the group that are all complaining, oh no, why, why? So I'll tell you something, it took me over 10 years to figure out, and I know many of you know this already, I can orchestrate the emotional connection people make at the beginning of their time together. And indeed, smart people orchestrate positive emotional connection between and amongst humans before they ask them to learn, to work, or to practice together. It took me a few years to figure it out. But it's important to know. So let's get to the four types of engagement. There's four types of learner engagement. The first type is academic engagement. And that's when, as a student, people will do things for a grade. Yes, I have to pass this test. Yes, I have to do this skill. In the world of hospital life, academic engagement is doing the mandated stuff. Oh, I have to do this, this, and this to keep my job. And that motivates some people, and it gets them engaged. Oh, stuff I have to do. The second type of engagement is behavioral engagement, and this is where people are actually doing something. They're not just existing in time. They're talking, they're thinking, they're touching, they're acting, they're doing behavioral engagement. The third type is cognitive engagement, and this is where we teach people to think critically or to clinically reason. Important, and it definitely keeps people engaged when we ask them, how will you handle this situation? Let's make all our mistakes here on paper or in practice, not when we're dealing with real patients and families. That's engaging. And the fourth type is emotional engagement, and I shared a little bit of my experience with that. How, as a nurse, I really wasn't trained in emotional engagement. I was down to brass tacks and business, knowledge and skills, let's go there. The rest of it, I mistakenly saw as fluff. Now, you know the importance of people, and you know the importance of people's skills and involvement, and I've explained that. But not only do I believe it, but I practice it, and I do it. And so in a minute here, I'm going to ask each and every one of you to get involved with just a few people here in a minute. Let's see how we're going to do this. If I'm going to ask you to get involved with people, I have to have a way to get your attention back. And this is what it is. It's a visual refocus sign. It's a yellow and purple hand in the air. This means freeze. Even if you're in the middle of a sentence, you're going to stop, freeze, and turn your attention forward. Now, some of us have eyes that have maybe a little bit of a challenge to see that, so I did bring the big guy. <laughs> so that no one can say they didn't see it, so let's have a dry run of our refocus signal. Make noise now. Oh good, it works, perfect. And now, now I'd like for you to answer this question for yourself only. What was the very first job you ever did 
for which you received a real paycheck. Think back. Now, it can't be babysitting for your brothers and sisters, because that wasn't a real paycheck. But what was the very first job you ever had for which you received a real paycheck? Think about it. What was it? And in a minute here, I'm going to ask you to share that with only one other person in this room. But this is how we're going to do it, in a very organized manner. I'd like for you to look to your right and smile at the person who's sitting there and memorize their face. And look to your left and smile and memorize their face. Just do that. Left, right, left, right. Is it there? I just put it back on. Okay, good. So now, the person on your left and the person on your right is ineligible for you to talk to. Oh, no, you're going to have to look behind you or a couple of people down. But all I'm going to ask you to do, and this is critical, is to stand up. Find just one person. Listen to their story and tell them yours about the very first job you ever had for which you received a real paycheck. You have only 60 seconds to accomplish this. Come to your feet and let's go. Tick, 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 ping. Time has expired. Wait, stay where you are. Stay where you are. Thank you for turning your attention forward. I realize that was a quick minute. Figure out which of the two of you, since you're in twos, is taller than the other. Quickly, who is taller than the other? This is easy as done standing. Okay, person who is the taller of the two of you, for the next 90 seconds, you're in charge of your partner not as tall. They're going to do what you ask them to do. Yes, indeed. People are wondering, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Well, here's what's going to happen. The two of you are going to stay together, and you're going to find four other people, and as quickly as you can, you're going to huddle into six, not four, not eight. Go. Six, 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 six. 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 Six is the number. Six. Six, six, six. Stay with your partner. Six. Anybody looking? Table of two, table of four. Hold up a hand. People will find you. Yes, six. Six, six, six. Table for one, table for two over here. All right. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, now there's part two of this. You are now a six, or as close to a six as possible. You're going to put your hands together just like this in front of you. So if you have anything in your hands, put them down for a minute. Can everybody see my hands? Now I'm going to count to three. When the word three comes out of my mouth, you open both hands. You point to the one person you'd like to see as the leader of this group, and you're going to make this sound. Ta-da! That's what you're going to do when I say three. Ready? One, two, three. Ta-da! <laughs> Count it up. Count it up. Okay, good. Now, what I need to see is the person on your team raising their hand who either A, had the most votes, or B, people are insisting you're the leader, whether that was true or not. So one per group, hand up. Let's see, raise a hand. You were, you were the leader. We need one per small group. One per small group. Good, good, good. Now, 
leader. Let's give you a round of applause before you know what you have to do. Yay. Okay, leader, here is your job, and it is threefold. There are three jobs you're going to have. Here's the first job. You're going to have exactly 90 seconds, I'm going to time you, to find one thing you all have in common that is, first, not boring or obvious, like we're all humans or we're all females. Nope, that's boring and obvious. It can't have anything to do with work in any way, healthcare, any, any part of nursing, any part of anything that has to do with your job is out the window. And the third thing is it has to be a little bit unique and your team is going to turn it into a name that you will love being called in this hour because I may be calling upon the name of your group. Now, let me just give you an idea. I had one group that figured out they all had dogs and they all happened to be females. So everybody referred to them as dog, dog, dog. They hated it after a short period of time. So be sure when you find the commonality and turn it into a team name, you love it. 90 seconds starts now. Time is up, but wait. That was the first job of the leader. Let's give them another round of applause. Good job. I told you they had three jobs. Here's the second job. The second job is this. These six of you are going to be competing against every other team in this room to win points that at the end of my time will redeem for prizes. So it's best if you're able to sit in this manner so you can quickly mobilize and answer questions, which would be three in one row and three immediately behind in the next row. And there are many, many chairs open over here if you feel like sardines. Leader, your job is to seat your team right now. Say, this is where we're sitting. You pick the spot. You're in charge. All right. Plenty of space. This is a lovely big room. All righty. So that wasn't such a bad job, right? That was job number two. Let's give them another round of applause for doing a job well. Thank you. The third job is, and is not the responsibility of the leader, can be delegated, it can be assigned, it can, you can recruit someone to do this job. One person on your team needs to find a post-it note. Now, I had them all up and down the ends of the, of the thing. Just one post-it note. One. That's all your team needs is one. One post-it note.
There are generally two in a stack, so one is all you need. Now let's get, get a moment and spend three full seconds profusely thanking the posted getter right now. Profusely thank, profusely thank, profusely thank. What have we learned? It's a good thing to volunteer. You'll get a lot of recognition. So now, on the post-it note that your team has acquired, write your team name down. Whatever you decided it was going to be, write it down. We're going to do our very first, what I'll call, low-tech trivia question. This will earn you points. On the post-it is your team name. The second thing that's going to go on the post-it is the team answer to the question I have yet to ask, but it will, it will come in a minute. From the time the first team brings a post-it down to the steps, I begin a 15-second countdown. That's how long every other team has to send a representative up to the steps to just put the post-it down. Now, wait a minute. Wait. Whoa, wait. You don't have an answer on it. You don't want to bring it down yet. When it has an answer, when it has an answer on it. Now, before we start this, we are observing the no tackling, no tripping rule. It just has to appear somewhere on the steps before time has expired. So here is the question for your team to answer on the post-it with your name on it. Here is the question. According to the University of Minnesota, what percentage of the average population of people walking down the street have to see it to learn it? What percentage of people have to see it to learn it? Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Got it. Perfect. Got it, got it, got it. So I am seeing such an incredibly large range. I'm looking to see all of the ones that come from either side. Wow. We have guesstimates as low as 35%. No, what? there's a 10 percenter. We have guesstimates as low as 10% to as high as 94%. Am I missing any ones? Something higher than that? I must be upside down. 70. 111 doesn't count. <laughs> OK, so the question is, according to the University of Minnesota, I have some winners in my hand here, what percentage of people have to see it to learn it? Drum roll on your, your legs, please. Drum roll. The answer is 80%. Okay, where are the helpers? Helpers? Okay. The parent people, parent squared. Where are we? P squared. Uh, the cokeheads. Ooh. Uh, the visionaries. We've got two of those. The fits. Where are the fits? And the gum chewers. OK. Any team that said 80%, that's worth a full point to your team. So somebody keep score. Now, there's a second trivia question I'm going to ask, but we're going to do this high-tech trivia. That means one of the people on your team who has a cell phone and knows how to text on it will text one answer from your team. So figure out who your team texter is quickly. Who's going to text for your team? Who's going to text?
please let it be the skilled person and not the one who's not, because I have people calling me on the phone sometimes when I ask people to text me. I'm going to put my phone number up. You're going to text me your team answer and your team name. You're with me here? Answer and name has to come through. And I will start counting down when answers begin to arrive. So here is the phone number. 504-914-1400. Now there was a study quoted in USA Today about three months ago that talked about the attention span of people under the age of 25. So here's my question. In waking hours, according to that study, what is the longest time interval that people under the age of 25 will stay away from their cell phones, their own personal technology? How many minutes in waking hours? Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten, nine, eight, seven, push then, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Now, as the numbers come in, I'm going to start at the bottom of the list and give you just a sampling of what people are guessing so that we know. We have 90 seconds. <laughs> we have 15 minutes. We have 5 minutes. We have 10 minutes. We have 3 minutes. 45 minutes, wow, such a great range. 10 minutes, five. Some of the names here are incredibly fun. So let's see, 10, five, 10, seven. Seconds, I have people who are guessing answers in seconds. I will tell you this, the study did say minutes, but it's okay, don't text me any new answers. Let's see if anybody got it on the nose. I'm looking to see. Hmm. Okay, I'm looking for the Globe Trotters, the Summit Sharks, the Dark Chocolate Group, the Cool Shoes Group, and let's see if there's another. Uh, I think that's about it. The answer was, tw drum roll please, 25 minutes. So if you said 20 minutes, anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes, you're getting a full point for that. So clap for yourselves. Now, t some teams play strategy and they wait until later in the presentation to score points to try to give everybody else a false sense of security. You know how that is. So what I need now is for your team to think about, guesstimate, and write this number down. How many drops of water can you place on the head of a penny before it gets to be too much water that it actually runs off the penny, you have 60 seconds to come up with a number. How many drops of water do you think can go on the head of the penny before it gets to be too much and it just runs off? The number must be written down somewhere so that you can guarantee what your guesstimate was. 
Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call out just randomly the names of seven teams. And if I call your team name, you're going to send two representatives to the front up here. Because I actually have pennies and I actually have droppers of water. And two people from your team, one is going to have a steady hand and just drop, drop, drop. The other person is going to be the official counter of how many drops the penny actually holds. So let me just name some teams, figure out if your team is called. Uh, indeed, who will come down for you? The Beach Babes, where are you Beach Babes? Come on, the Ha Ha's, where are the Ha Ha's? The Smiles, send your representative up Smiles. The Margaritas, the High Fives. The All My Children team. <laughs> and please position yourself. I have four on this side and three on this side. Come on down. Okay, here they come, right over here. Now, you all made guesstimates, and they're going to do the actual, because you know it's good to guess things. But what will the actual be? And you see, I put the penny on a piece of post-it note so you don't have to worry about water getting on the stage. But whoever's the steady-handed person, reach down, get your dropper full. Whoever's the counter, step close. And please begin. Please begin and steady hands. While they're doing this, I'd like to see some and hear some guesstimates of what people said their team guessed. So let me just, for example, what did you guess? Three, three here. How about it at this team? Is that four fingers? Three, oh, consensus, yeah. 25. How about over here? Okay, zero. Five. So we're, and they're still working at it. We're going to hear what the actual is here because it should be extremely interesting. How about this team? Twelve. Three. Ten. Five. Six. Six. Twenty. I'm hearing twenty. Can't quite. Forty. And this is forty-four or four? Okay, so it looks like some have finished. So I'm going to ask, how many? 26. 26. 33. 27. 19. Wait, coming over here. 3. 23. 13. Now, all of the teams who had representatives up here get to add a point to their score. Let's give them a hand. They're coming back. Thank you all very much. So let me ask you this question. How accurate were you being in the range here with people? We had a low of three, but we had a much higher range in the 40s. How many of you are just a little bit surprised by this? Anybody? I love to use this activity at the beginning of a staff meeting or the beginning of an educational offering because you know why? People are shocked and amazed by it. And it's hands-on. And it, it causes a little bit of critical thinking. Gee, why? Why would there be such a range? Why would it be possible that one of the pennies here held only three drops, but another held in over 40 drops? What would the explanation be? And you know what I think? I think it's important that any time you and I do an involving activity that we tie it to an important lesson. So let me ask you this. What are the variables? They're all standard droppers, okay? All standard droppers, all gotten from a drugstore, same one, in packs. Now the people were different. The water was all the same. It wasn't any kind of funny trick water. What other variable is there? Okay, it could be the distance. How high up were they dropping? It's harder to, to get it to stay if you're dropping up here versus very close. What else? The pennies? 
Oh my, let's think about that, the pennies. Each penny is minted the same from the U.S. government, yet it has its own penny life, doesn't it? Some pennies have really rough lives, and they can only accommodate three drops before it runs off the edge. They've been under a train. They've had some bubble gum on them. They have had a difficult life experience. But our penny that holds 40 drops of water, my goodness, it hasn't had such a hard time. It hasn't been chewed up by life and by cars and railroad tracks, right? What does this compare to? It compares to patience. You can have two patients that were born in the same year, like two pennies minted in the same year, yet their needs are very different. And individualized care is everything in knowing what it is. Maybe this patient needs only three drops of pain medication and this one needs 26. Maybe in an acute situation, less is needed versus a chronic situation where more is needed. Each penny has had its own life. And therefore, we can sometimes misassess what their needs are until we actually start dropping the water, until we're actually giving the care. We may not know. We may not know what the need is. But anytime I use pennies, I like to make this point. So tell me, if we were to take all of these pennies and we were to take them over to a gas station over here in downtown Nashville and we were to spend those pennies, how much are they worth? one cent each. And this is a point for all of us to remember and to teach others. Every one is of equal value. It doesn't matter what condition we're in, right? We're all of equal value. Now, let me just say this. It's important to get that point across to people, but tell me, which way is it more powerful? Me saying, good morning, Everyone is of equal value. Blah, 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 blah. Or is it more impactful to ask people, how many drops do you think a penny would be? Oh, okay, let's try it out. And now, how does that compare to people? Isn't that a better, involving way, engaging way to learn? I want you to think about how sometimes it might take one or two more minutes to do an involving activity, but if the message gets in there and stays in long-term memory, how that's really what we want to invest in. We want to invest in long-term memory. So I have a cartoon I'd like to show you. It's a baby blues cartoon. We need to talk, young lady. Sit down, says mom. She says to her little girl, now Zoe, if you remember I asked you and Hammy to pick up your toys an hour ago, what does Zoe hear? Wah, 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 wah. What does Zoe see? A cartoon in her head is going on. Wah, 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 finishes mom. She asks her daughter, okay? What does little Zoe say? Okay. She talks to her brother and he asks, what did she say? And she said, I don't know. When the talk gets too long, I change the channel. How many of you suspect that sometimes when you're talking to people, communicating or teaching them, they're mental channel surfing? Just a quick show of hands. Have you ever seen some mental channel surfing? Because I have some symptoms I've seen. Here's the first one, nap jerk. <laughs> Second one I've seen is a Pez head. You know how Pez candies dispense? The next one, a Bombi, a Bombi. Now let me show you what a Bombi looks like and you can tell me if you've ever seen this. <laughs> to me they sort of look like zombies but I looked up zombie in the dictionary and a zombie is a living dead creature without a brain. Every creature we teach has a brain, so brain plus zombie, Bombi. I made up the word, it's not real. The next one, eyelid Pilates. <laughs> I know you've seen it, right? Yeah. A few others, prayerful thought. <laughs> They're trying to look thoughtful. You're doing a fabulous explanation. You're even impressing yourself. Somebody says, wait, I have a question. You say, oh, great, what question do you have? 
and they ask you a question that has nothing whatsoever to do with what you were talking about. I call it the where did it come from question, followed closely by the I just said that question. <laughs> One or two more. If you have people sitting down and taking notes, you'll sometimes see what's called doze doodle. People put their heads down but try to look as if they're still taking notes. <laughs> Another one I know you're familiar with, electronics, histronics. People are texting, people are tweeting, they're Facebooking, they're doing their bank accounts, they're on their own personal technology, not hooked to what you're doing. And the last one, the scariest one to me, is the bobblehead. This is the person that you know is clueless, but they're trying to oversell that they don't need you. Oh, no, I'm good. No, no, I'm really, it's, it's good. Fine, fine, I've done that. I've seen that. I've been there. Raise a hand if you've ever seen any of these. Have you? There's a reason why mental channel surfing happens, and it's because speed of speech is 110 to 160 words per minute, while speed of thought is 400 to 1,000 words per minute. People think much faster than you and I can ever talk. And so when we're relying on verbal explanation, it's like we're walking on a sidewalk and people are on 10 speeds wanting to go much faster than we can. So let me ask you, is it possible for a person on a 10 speed to slow down enough to keep up with somebody walking on a sidewalk? Is it possible? Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Is it comfortable? Do people want to do it for long periods of time? No, they don't. After a certain period of time, they get on their bikes and they mental channel surf. Now, sometimes people will say to me, how long is it we have before the people we're talking, teaching, communicating with go on their own mental channel surfing trips? Well, according to Tony Buzon in his book, Use Both Sides of Her Brain, he says you can actually make adults sit for up to 90 minutes at a time without a physical break but that after 20 minutes, eh, they go off on their own mental trip. So let's look at the challenge of this. Let's say that this is, oh, 20 minutes of attention, and let's say that this is a lot more than 20 minutes worth of stuff to get across to people. In fact, some of us have five-gallon jugs, and we start delivering our content, and everything is fine till we hit the rim. And when we hit the rim, we might see a nap jerk there. We may see a bomb be there. But what do most people think? That's not my concern. Let me continue to deliver my content. Yes, there's a garbage bag and a lot of plastic down here. Don't worry. What happens to that information we're delivering while they're mental channel surfing? What happens? It's lost into the garbage. It's lost in spillover. And what scares me is what stays in the cup may not be the need to know. Wouldn't that be scary? We have proof that this happens when people come to us after we teach them things and they say stuff like, you didn't teach us that. Uh-uh, we didn't go over that. No, we didn't learn that. And you could show them on an outline, a syllabus, or a description where it happened. So let me put my picture down. Because people always want to know, how can I prevent spillover from happening? There are two ways. Here's the first way. Not chug their brains, no. Stop and let them digest. At intervals, ask people to think. Digestion from an educational point of view, is thinking. How will this apply to you? How will this save you time on the job? How will this make it better for the patients? Ask people to think. But there's a second way you and I can prevent spillover from happening. So pick up your pretend remote control. I know some of us at home never get to touch these, but pretend you, pretend you have it, and I want you to point it way over here at this screen, and I want you to push it, and I want you to say this at the same time. Change something you're doing. Change something you're doing. Or let's point it over to this one. Change something they're doing. Change something they're doing. That's the key, folks. Something has to change. You can't just continue to communicate with people who are mental channel surfing because it's... It's sort of an inefficient way of using time. 
So think, what can you to do to change things? How can you involve people? How can you make things better for them? How can you get them engaged in a variety of ways? And now I really want to tell you this story because I know it's a bizarre story. Last night, I had the weirdest dream, and you were all in it. That's what was weird. I was standing here, and you were all sitting there in chairs, and then I closed my eyes, and I opened them, and we were all in an empty football stadium. So I want you to just pretend we're in an empty football stadium. And what happened was the cheerleaders came up, and they were so excited to see us, they wanted to practice cheering. So we were their practice squad. So here's what they did. Give me an A. a. Give me an S. S. Give me an S. S. Give me an E. e. Give me an S. S. Give me an S. S. What's it spell? Assess. Now we're going to chant that three times. Assess. 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 Then EMS. Let's do it again. Assess. 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 Then EMS. Once more. Assess. Assess, assess, then EMS. Now, we started that cheer, and then I, I looked down, and by my feet there was this giant heart. And I checked it to see if it was beating. Did it have a heartbeat? And, and it didn't. And when we looked out onto the field, we saw this giant can compressor. And the grounds person was compressing cans. In fact, he was compressing 30 at a time. Compress, 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 compress. How many? 30, and at the end of the 30th can, the cheerleaders would turn on the wind socks, and we'd have ventilate, ventilate. Then we'd have compress, 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 compress. How many? 30, ventilate, ventilate. And this went on for quite some time until suddenly these five huge cycles, brum, 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 came into the stadium. You know, the really big, loud ones? Broom, broom, five cycles. And they stopped in the middle, and the people on the cycle stood up, and they yelled, switch. Isn't that strange? <laughs> five cycles, switch. And when they yelled that, walking up towards us, standing there, was Prince Charming. And in one hand, he had an AED. And the other hand, he had a bag and a mask. And you know what he said? He said, I'll do compressions. And when he did that, can you hear it? The heart started beating. What a strange story. Let's go through it again. First, our cheer. Then I found the heart and it wasn't beating. What happened in the middle of the field? How many? 30 to two ventilations, 30 to two, 30 to two, until what rode in? Shouted, switch, and up walked Prince Charming with his, and his bag and mask, and he said, I'll do compressions. And when he said that, the heart indeed started beating. What is this I'm talking about? Can anybody tell me? It's CPR. It's a bizarre story with the current guidelines in CPR, but I'll tell you as someone who's, who's taught staff for many years in a hospital, and if you're good at it, you get to teach everybody, the cleaning staff, the dietary people. If you're good at nursing education, you get everybody. And I saw some of those people, some of the ancillary people's handshake, and get all flustered that they couldn't remember the process until I did something unusual and engaging, and then everybody smiles when they go through it. Think to yourself, how can you do that? Can you create something that will make it easier for people to learn and remember because they are involved? Now, leader, your last job is this. Twofold, two things have to happen. First thing is, you all stand up. Everybody stands. You have 60 seconds to go around and tell each other what's one thing you learned in this session you think is valuable information. You may indeed be able to use it when you get back on the job. Go, 60 seconds.
next item. Let's first give everybody a round of applause for sharing ideas. Next item, you're going to send a representative up to the front of the room. If you had one or more points, you're picking one brown lunch sack to take back to your team. You have exactly 30 shopping seconds to do that. If you don't yet have points, you're sending a representative over here to get a bag from the front for your team. Everybody gets a prize. It just depends on the side you're on. Both sides. Both sides are available. Be sure you get your prizes. Go back, hand them out. Important job. Go ahead and distribute prizes. There is something for everyone. Give them out. We're going to clap loudly now for all of our participation and the hard work we've done this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to just have a seat for a moment. Yeah, get your bag, please. There's still some good selection if you haven't gotten it yet. Don't worry. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank you all for participating and being energetic and listening to some new ideas, even one or two that might be a little bit unusual. And I'd like to finish with my coloring book. Because, you know, sometimes teaching people is just giving them a general outline of what they need to learn, correct? But sometimes you and I meet negative people. And they blow hot air at us. They say, ooh, that won't work, or you don't know. or So on the count of three, I want you to say hot air at my coloring book. Ready? One, two, three. Hot air. You know what those people get from us? They leave us blank, clueless. They get nothing. But sometimes people come and they take the outline that we give them and they invest themselves. They see relevance. They see usability. And they take what we've given them and they invest themselves in it. So to show your energy this afternoon, on the count of three, I'd like for you to yell your favorite color at my book. Are you ready? One, two, three. You know what those people leave us with? Not only do they get a complete outline but it comes fully and completely to life. And really, there's only one reason why this ever happens, and I hope you remember this, if nothing else. Every day you teach someone, you do magic. Thank you. <laughs>